And when you're talking about a country where the area of Ukraine that is contaminated with explosives right now is larger than the state of Florida. Now, are you going to be able to put a, a mine detector in your hand, just like you might see in a World War II movie, and go over every inch of the state of Florida? You're going to have to take to, to try new things. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, we've been fortunate in that we've had uh, partnerships from American companies who are helping us deploy new technology. It's going to take truly a Marshall Plan of thinking and resources, of partnerships, of government and people, um, all to address it. This conflict, it started back in 2014, and I uh, personally see this uh, horrible impact of uh, hostilities and fighting, especially uh, impact of landmine and other explosive ordnance on the ground when people, they, uh, they cannot use the land plots for farming. They cannot go to the forest for picking mushrooms, or they cannot go to the forest for simply having like uh, fun and relaxing there. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Welcome to Coffee with Closers, a podcast produced by Pinkston, a strategic communications firm headquartered just outside Washington, DC. We talk with some of America's most influential closers, from industry-leading CEOs to best-selling authors, professional athletes, entrepreneurs, and everyone in between. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, as we take you on an informative, thought-provoking, and highly entertaining journey into the lives of highly successful, driven, forward-thinking disruptors who are making a lasting impact in their field and on society. Joining us on this week's episode of Coffee with Closers is Chris Watley, Executive Director of the Halo Trust USA and Valeria Shumska, Program Officer with the Halo Trust. The Halo Trust is the largest landmine clearance organization in the world, operating in approximately 30 countries with programs designed to get rid of landmines and other explosive devices left behind by war and regional conflict. Today, we discuss the organization's most urgent priority, war-torn Ukraine, where landmines are not only injuring and killing innocent civilians, but making it harder for farmers to grow crops and in turn, feed the world. Uh, Chris, Valeria, um, welcome to Coffee with Closers. It's great to have you guys today. Thank you. It's All a right. pleasure to be here. You're great. And welcome to the United States. I'm Glad you're enjoying your stay here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And I'm really excited to be here and to tell you more about our work. Great. Well, let's uh, let's start with you, Chris. <clears throat> um, so you are the executive director of Halo USA, which is the American arm of Halo Trust. Let's start at a high level. Just tell us um, about what Halo Trust is, um, when it started, and what your overall mission is. The Halo Trust is the world's largest landmine clearance organization, and I know most Americans don't think about landmine clearance on a day-to-day -day basis. To the extent that you think of Halo, you probably remember a moment way back in 1997 when Princess Diana walked into a minefield, sure. and that was Halo she walked into a minefield with. And we, we clear landmines in 28 different countries. We've been around since 1988. We have 12,000 staff, and 97% of those are locally hired people from the countries that are impacted by landmines working to clear the deadly devices in their midst. When you talk about landmines and deadly devices, <clears throat> um, it's more than just um, it, it's more than just landmines. It can be any kind of explosives. Can you get, just give us just a general sense of what the range of that might be? You're exactly right, Steve. That. There are the traditional landmines that you might think of from a World War II movie, mm -hmm. often a circle. You've got uh, smaller ones that are designed to, to affect individuals walking down a, a lane or through a farmer's field. Those are called anti-personnel mines. And then larger ones that are really designed to destroy vehicles, anti-tank mines or anti-vehicle mines. But anything, anything that can explode and, and endanger a civilian are things that we clear. So. Okay. Often those are cluster munitions, small kind of grenade-sized bomblets that are distributed through rockets or aircraft bombs. They could also be grenades themselves that, that are left over from a, from a battle between infantry. They could be artillery shells. 
I think that if Americans have been paying attention to this war, often what they see are just these vast fields where you see craters that look like World mm. War I. Well, for every, you know, 10 of those craters you might see, there, there are three that didn't go off. And those are artillery shells that are under the ground. And a farmer goes back into that field to, to you know, lay, to, to sow, sow a crop right after the war ends. And if they're not cleared, they're a, they're a deadly threat to them. We're going to talk about Ukraine in a minute, um, but can you give us a sense of where you operate in the world? We operate basically anywhere that is in conflict now okay. or that was touched by conflict decades ago. Okay. So to give you some examples, you know, my father was a fighter pilot. He served in, in Southeast Asia. We are clearing, uh, we, we cl clearing ordinance from that conflict in Laos um, that, that continues to be a threat to civilians today. So, so if you don't clear these devices now, they stay with you and they keep killing civilians for decades. Mm. So we're, we're working in places with legacy conflicts, such as Angola in, in, in Africa, or Laos and Cambodia in Southeast Asia, but also the conflicts that are in the front and center of the headlines in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. We still have 2,000 Afghan employees clearing IEDs and other explosives in Afghanistan today, in Ethiopia, in, in any place that you can think of where there is an active conflict, chances are Halo will be there. I know it's hard to quantify, but do you have any sense of how many of these explosive devices exist in the world today? I saw one estimate, 30 million mines strewn in at least 18 countries, um, at least from one report. Is there a sense of what's out there? I think, I, I think it's everybody's best guess. Yeah. So that, that 30 million is, uh, is probably as good a guess as any, and maybe on the low end, yeah. definitely 18 countries is on the low end. When this whole kind of journey towards a commitment to build a landmine-free world, which Diana started, mm -hmm. the world was talking about over 100 million mines in the ground. Yeah. And a lot has been cleared, but there still remain tens of millions more. And then unfortunately, because of conflicts like Ukraine, you still have some countries actively laying them. So the problem gets has gotten better in some ways, much better than 1997 for most of the world. But in, in certain corners of the country or, or certain co corners of countries in, in, in the world that we're in, uh, particularly Ukraine, it remains an active, active challenge. Great. Let's turn to Ukraine now. Um, to Chris here, we'll start with you. Um, war has been going on now for more than a year. <clears throat> Your CEO, James Cowan, said, and I quote, the clearance of unexploded ordnance and landmines from Ukrainian land is one of the greatest challenges caused by war in recent history. How so? Well, I would say, first of all, just to, to step back one step, yep. um, we've been in Ukraine since 2016, yep. and that's because there's been a war going on since 2014. But I think for, all, for most of us, we really started focusing on the war when the Russians invaded mm -hmm. about a year ago. Uh, so, so for us, the level of intensity of fighting is what makes it the greatest challenge that we face. Uh, this is the biggest land war in Europe since World War II. You have the Russian side, anyway, actively laying anti-personnel mines, using cluster munitions at a, at a vast scale, and, and therefore uh, no greater priority for HALO. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about the, um, the negative impacts this is having on uh, the agriculture-based economy uh, in Ukraine. I know that there's ramifications of what's going on globally. Um, I know Ukraine is a large exporter, I believe, of wheat and I think sunflower oil and other <clears throat> staples. So, Steve, you're exactly right. I think that the challenge for addressing landmine contamination, and that's often how we talk about it, is land that is contaminated with these murderous devices, explosives of whatever kind we tend to, to refer to as a landmine challenge. It, for Ukraine, it's about not only saving lives in Ukraine, restoring mm -hmm. livelihoods in Ukraine, it's about feeding the world. Mm -hmm. So what, what happens in addressing this challenge is equally important to feeding uh, civilians who are stuck in famine in Ethiopia and Somalia. It's relevant to the prices that we pay at the grocery store ourselves in the United States. Right. That dealing the agricultural devastation from this conflict, which means getting these explosives out of the ground so that, so that farmers can get their tractors back in the field, 
is a priority for the world as well as for Ukraine. Got it. In response, Halo Trust has called for a Marshall Plan for mines in Ukraine. What does that plan entail in terms of um, manpower, equipment, uh, financial or other resources? I think it means deploying resources at a scale and in different ways than we've ever seen before. Yeah. So cer- certainly uh, for us as Halo, we, we know that the, the challenge of just clearing the provinces in the north of Ukraine, because for, for Americans, it's hard to picture this conflict, but, but think about it as if the Russians had invaded the United States and they had been pushed back from the, the gates of Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. That's what happened for, for Ukraine. They, they pushed back the Russians at the gates of Kiev. And now they, they fortunately have liberated these provinces. Those provinces, they're just right around the capital. You're talking about over 100 million to just clear the, the contamination in those wow. areas. Wow. So it's going to take a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of resources, both from the private sector and American companies and American private philanthropists have been fantastic supporters of this work. And it's going to take governments from around the world, not just the U.S. You know, it's going to take the whole world to address it. And I think it's going to take new thinking at the same time. You know, for us, it is such a slow, methodical process to clear an individual landmine. And when you're talking about a country where the area of Ukraine that is contaminated with explosives right now is larger than the state of Florida. Wow. Now, are you going to be able to put a a mine detector in your hand, just like you might see in a World War II movie, and go over every inch of the state of Florida? You're going to have to take... To, to try new things. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, we've been fortunate in that we've had uh, partnerships from American companies who are helping us deploy new technology, you know, armored tractors from John Deere that are helping us clear at greater scale and in, in new ways. But it's going to take all that. It's going to take truly a Marshall Plan of thinking and resources, of partnerships, of government and people, um, all to address it. And Addressing it isn't just about Ukraine and doing the right thing for Ukraine. It's about ensuring that the, the entire global food supply and, and prices that we pay at grocery stores here in the United States are addressed at the same time. How many people do you have on the ground in Ukraine right now working and how many do you need? We have 700 today. Okay. Uh, we are looking to, have, to double that number by the end of the year. Okay. Um, now, these are overwhelmingly Ukrainians. Uh, mm-hmm. We have a handful of of international experts who are helping out with some of the specialized skills, but it's a program that is led and executed by Ukrainians who are stepping up. You know, these are often, uh, you know, single moms who the husband's serving on the front line in the Ukrainian military. And, and she's walked into our office and she's looking to play a role in addressing the the exact same crisis that's facing her nation. Uh, It's, it's uh, Ukrainians of all walks of life who come in, are trained to safely operate and play a role in, in making land safe for their, for their own children and their neighbors. And I assume it's going to take an incredible amount of financial. Uh, there's a financial need here as well, probably in the millions. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, you know, we are the largest landmine clearance organization in Ukraine itself, in yeah. addition to being the largest landmine clearance organization around the world. Uh, you know, fortunately, we've had uh, l- lots of of uh, donors, supporters, champions uh, who've, who've come to us, but but we definitely need more. Uh, quite frankly, we have a partnership with an organization called Donor C, uh, C like S E E. Sure. Uh, they they are running a campaign to mobilize individual Americans. That we've got a matching funder for that. Um, and you'd be amazed, even even a small contribution from a private donor can make such a difference. In that that government fo- funders are great, but they're slow. They've got restrictions on their funding. When we want to do something new, like use drones in new ways to try to find the landmines as quickly as possible, because you've got to map them before you can clear them. Those are things that we can only do with private resources. So, uh, so I have to say for every American who's, who's stepped up and, and made a $20 donation or, or gone on to DonorC and got one of those matching contributions, it makes all the difference. You're listening to Coffee with Closers, a podcast produced by Pinkston, a strategic communications firm based just outside Washington, D.C. Whether your organization is looking for traditional public relations, creative content, or business strategy to support brand awareness or protect against reputational risks, our team of highly dedicated, experienced, 
and successful communications professionals stand at the ready to help you break through the noise in today's ever-changing and competitive news cycle. For more on our services and capabilities, we invite you to visit us at pinkston.co. And don't forget, subscribe to our podcast, which is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon, and iHeartRadio Podcasts. Great. Okay, Valeria, we'll turn to you now. Well, again, welcome to the United States. Glad you're enjoying your time here. Thank you, um, Steve. So you're a program officer with the Halo Trust. You are on the ground in Ukraine, leading the teams, doing the work. Um, but let's start um, just at a personal note. Um, tell us a little about yourself, uh, where you grew up, and maybe where you went to school or any other... I come from the east of Ukraine. So okay. this is actually the area where a Halo Trust um, had it its original area of operations. Uh, I come from from a small but very beautiful village. Um, um, I've been studying law in Kharkiv. Uh, Kharkiv is like a bigger city, which is also in the east of Ukraine and has been affected by ongoing war a lot. And uh, when I graduated uh, my law school, I went back to my small town because I have uh, lots of friends there and I really like my uh, region. So I went back home and um, uh, actually my village is uh, somewhere like um, like in the countryside and I've been, I used to drive uh, every day from village to town to visit my grandmother and um, I uh, one day I noticed like on the side road there were there were like hail of vehicles parked uh, and I also noticed like um, mine danger mine signs uh, set in like next to the road. I spoke to people who were there at, at that time and it turned out that Halo Trust had um, a minefield there and the team has been working on uh, removing landmines. And at that point I, I understood that this is probably a great opportunity to contribute to a safer future of my country because as um, Chris uh, mentioned before this conflict it started back in 2014 and I uh, personally see this uh, horrible impact of uh, hostilities and fighting, especially uh, impact of landmine and other explosive ordnance on the ground when people, they uh, they cannot use the land plots for farming. They cannot go to the forest for picking mushrooms mm -hmm. or they cannot go to the forest for simply having like uh, fun and relaxing there. And uh, seeing um, Halo Trust on the ground, I understood that I can continue tribute somehow and I uh, started out as an interpreter there uh, in 2020 and since then I've been promoted to the monitoring and evaluation officer roles, role which means uh, uh, working with the donors, uh, tracking progress, uh, how many land we cleared and telling that to uh, the donors and to the communities and quite recently I uh, take uh, I took the role of the program officer which is more strategic and more um, more responsible uh, so that I work closely with the donors and I can tell you that this support we receive both from American society, from individuals from the other countries, that helps us uh, a lot. And uh, the scale of contamination in my country uh, is huge. And unfortunately, with the ongoing war, uh, it's only gonna gonna grow. Uh, so that means that Halo Trust will need to stay in Ukraine for maybe decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, that also uh, highlights the need for funding and for supporting the Ukraine. What are, um, what are some of the greatest challenges that you and your team face that may not be financial, may not be equipment? Just what are some of the, I mean, we talked about, um, Chris, and you talked about some of the other what what are the greatest challenges that you that you face um, just in your work? I would say working uh, uh, with the war and going is a huge mm -hmm. challenge, and the team uh, um, shows its um, like huge dedication, and they are they are so 
passionate about the work we do because last last year when the war just broke out we had to suspend our operations in the east and we had to evacuate our staff because our staff is our key uh, source and we had to make sure that they are safe so we suggested people to uh, come to uh, the uh, to the safer area of Ukraine and to stay with Hela so we've got a lot of people who are displaced people I mean they used to live in the east of Ukraine and because of the war they relocated to Kiev region to the capital and they stay with Halo that means that um, they had to build their life from scratch okay. they they don't have their homes they don't have the usual things around but they they've got Halo support and uh, that's that's that was our like uh, big big um, achievement that we managed to stay on the ground even in this uh, unsettling time uh, and uh, yeah that would probably be the the hugest like challenge uh, uh, yeah can you you talked about large swaths of Ukraine are have ordinances and landmines that you need to clear how do you where do you start? Like, how do you, how does, how does the process work in terms of identifying an impacted area, the equipment that's used, the detonation itself? Um, and I assume that when you clear one plot, it's, it could come back, right? People could, or, I mean, it must, you're always chasing something, right? I mean, it's, how does, how does that work? How does the process work? Uh, to start with, uh, we um, can, we work only in the deoccupied area. So okay. as soon as the Russians withdrew from the north of Ukraine, we were able to get permission and to Got start it. our work. It was like uh, emergency response because the scale of contamination, the amount of mines laid there and other explosives, uh, it was huge. And as soon as we got the permission to work in those areas, we've got teams who uh, go and visit the settlements, they identify explosive items and they map them uh, so that the future clearance teams, the demining teams, the deminers, they go and they know exactly where the minefield is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of like a level of uh, uh, ensuring the safety of our staff because they know exactly where to go and which type of explosive items they deal with. So as soon as the minefield is identified and mapped, uh, we have our demining teams, uh, on, we, we deploy them on the ground and they start that this time consuming, very time consuming, yeah. but uh, very important process of removing landmines from uh, war affected communities. We also have uh, uh, the other activity, which is um, very important for for the uh, population safety. Uh, we go to the communities uh, where fighting took place before and we speak to the locals uh, and we educate them. We tell them that there was fighting there and you can find uh, this mine or this grenade because uh, very often uh, you won't be able even see a grenade on a like attached to the tree. And uh -huh. uh, we tell people like uh, the most widespread ways how the items usually can be identified in the ground, how they look like and how you need to behave in case if you encounter the mine. And we also tell, tell people um, where they need to report. I mean, Ukrainian uh, authorities and or HALO itself. No, and, and I'm just to add to that, sure. I would say, you know, we, we have an, an incredible partnership with the Ukrainian government and and we can't emphasize enough the bravery of our Ukrainian colleagues. So sure. the equivalent of the 911 service in Ukraine is the state emergency service. And literally, if you call and you found an explosive in your backyard, you've just moved back, you were a refugee, you're returning to your home. And my God, there, there, there's an unexploded shell or landmine in your yard. The state emergency service is going to be the one that responds first. But they got to move fast. They're, it's a small service. They're they're gonna they're gonna clear what is most immediate, and then they're gonna move on. Yeah. And quite often, what happens is 
if they confront um, a level of contamination and a, 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 num a number of explosives that are beyond their capacity to, to deal with quickly, that's when they bring us in. And then we deploy teams who work comprehensively over a period of weeks. And at the end of that time, you know, it is our responsibility as Halo to say, that's land that's safe enough for your children to go into. Okay. Um, the, what, what the state emergency service is doing is a bit like what, what the military would do, where you have to clear something that is absolutely immediate, but then you got to move. But if you're the farmer and you, you're going to get in your tractor, or if you're the family and you're going to say it's okay for my kids to go on the playground, you're looking for a level of, of assurance that's far greater than that. And, and, and that's what we provide very much in partnership with, uh, with the Ukrainian government. This is a very time-consuming process, very painstaking. Let me ask you this. Before you guys go into an area, do you, can you block off or cordon off sections that you know you need to get to? so that a child or a family or a school, people just don't wander into a field or, um, or that's deemed unsafe until you can, you can get to that location? Or is it, how does that work? Good, good point. Well, well, we do a couple of different things. So we are using open source reporting and even some um, artificial intelligence tools to try to map individual data points of explosives. You know, so somebody's sharing a tweet with a picture of an explosive device, we capture all that information. So oh, we're wow. constantly sharing information on where explosive risk might be. Okay. Uh, but that, is, that isn't a level of specificity that will necessarily be able to, to, to tell you where you can and can't, can't go. So we use that to inform those teams that Valeria talked about that go out into communities and they actually find the devices and they use a very specific set of protocols that we have to say, okay, you've, you've, had, you've had an accident over here. You know, you had a vehicle that blew up on an anti-tank mine. You, you see an unexploded shell there. You calculate lots of other variables around it, and then you cordon off an area, and that becomes an actual minefield in our, okay. in, in our metrics where, where there are danger signs and you keep people out, and then you, you comprehensively deploy teams that, that clear it and release it. Uh, but in the interim, there are lots of different parts of the, uh, of the country in that, you know, Florida-sized level of land that is now awash in murderous devices that, that haven't been mapped that way, that don't have the danger signs. And that's why the, the education outreach that Valeria talked about, the getting into schools and telling kids to look, uh, what to look for or to yeah. meeting with the farmers and telling them what to look for is so important in the interim. Larry, I had a couple of last questions for you. Obviously, the work that you do is very important. It's very, um, very time intensive. Um, how do you maintain uh, high morale levels? I, I got to assume at some level this is very tough work. It's very difficult, you know, and people have been injured and lost their lives, you know, as a result of, of, of what's been left. Um, so how do, you, how do you maintain high morale for yourself and the teams that, the teams that you lead? That's an absolutely great question. And, you know, uh, I always try to find the good things even in the most difficult times because yeah. that helps you to live through it easier and to, to, stay, to stay on track. And what I see, I was thinking the other day, like what, what can be good about this war when people, people are dying, buildings are destroyed, even like my grandparents' building was destroyed in Kharkiv region, so mm. they, they don't have uh, where to go back. Uh, and I was thinking, what, what's good about this situation? There is like this war is atrocious and uh, I was struggling to find good things. But then I remembered like how people, how Ukrainians, uh, uh, how brave they are and how uh, like how unified they are uh, the unity and the social cohesion they show uh, during this this time it's been like the second year of war already and uh, the uh, the dedication uh, they uh, desire to to help the country and to 
not, not to give up. That's probably what inspired me a lot, especially with my Ukrainian colleagues. Uh, as I as I mentioned before, lots of them they are displaced people who and like lots of families they are separated because of the war. Some people had to go abroad. There are lots of refugees in Europe and other countries. Uh, some of some people they just had to go to the west part of Ukraine. Uh, it's it's the same with my family. But like those uh, those level of um, desire to change something and to be uh, this solidarity, that's probably what inspired me, me the most. Chris, I want to turn back to you. Um, I understand Hello Trust is in the midst of uh, its latest fundraising campaign. Uh, I know you're working with philanthropist, philanthropist Mitzi Perdue. Um, so what is your target goal with the with this latest effort, effort and what are your most pressing uh, needs today in the country? Well, first of all, Mitzi's been amazing. Yeah. Uh, she's uh, r- really uh, become a philanthropist for Ukraine on many different levels. And, and I believe when she was in Ukraine itself and saw the needs for landmine clearance, yeah. that's when she found her way, way to us. And uh, we've set a goal of raising $300,000 wow. uh, in partnership with Donor C. Uh, Mitzi has been helping get out the word about it and, and has been an absolute uh, key supporter on it. And as I'd say, you know, there, there's so many big numbers that are thrown out with, uh, with a humanitarian challenge like the one that we face with Ukraine. But these individual fast-moving investments, you know, being able to, to buy that drone and get it out in, you know, flying over Bucha. You know, yeah. Bucha is one of those towns that's been in the news cycle because it was devastated by the Russians. Atrocious human rights violations. Uh, you know, I was out there with our survey team going through a backyard that looked like it could have been in any other suburb. Wow. It could have been in any place in the United States, except for the backyard was strewn with cluster munitions. And for us to be able to, to map that contamination and address it, we need not only brave Ukrainians like Valeria, mm-hmm. but we need new technologies. We need to be able to map that faster using drones and other things. And that's why the campaign that Mitzi's leading uh, to get three hundred thousand dollars to to support these kind of fast moving interventions is absolutely key for us, and it's donor c slash ukraine dot com. Um, so we, you know, any any support we can get, we are deeply grateful for, and it will go straight to the front line. It's great. In nineteen ninety seven, the Ottawa uh, Mine Ban Treaty was signed, which called for countries to unite to rid the world of landmines. Um, you mentioned Princess Diana. Uh, earlier, uh, it came shortly after her her trip uh, through one of Halo's minefields in Angola, I believe it was. Looking back 25 years of, of, of work, how much progress have we made and what more needs to be done? Well, if you think back to that moment in 1997, when she was walking through that minefield, the estimates were that a place like Angola, it would take 100 years to clear mm-hmm. those, those landmines. Now, 30 years later, or 25 years plus later, there's still some landmines to clear in Angola. Mm-hmm. But you've reduced that, that time horizon by, by decades, by you know, 70 years or so. But it's still a reminder that once you put these, these devices in the ground, it takes the methodical work to get them out if you want to live in a world where kids don't blow up on, on the way to school. But for Diana, she achieved that. She, she mobilized the world. They passed this treaty. She got the world to think about this problem. So a problem for that one country, Angola, that was 100 years into the future to, to possibly solve, we're getting close to getting that, 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 that job done. Yeah. Uh, so... These, these aren't problems that you can just snap your finger and make them go away. Once the fighting stops in Ukraine, like Valeria said, there's going to be a lot of work to be done. But leadership matters. And Diana made that difference. But for now, I, I, you know, going forward, that leadership is going to lie in lots of different people. Yeah. It, it's in what Mitzi's doing. It's in what Valeria's doing. It's what, what happens in Congress on a bipartisan level. I, I think that it's been a true blessing to see landmine be a priority in the Trump administration, yeah. a priority in the Biden administration, yeah. a priority on both sides. I think most Americans can agree that kids shouldn't blow up on these devices. 
Is the United States the largest um, investor in in this uh, in this effort? I believe I saw four point two billion uh, since ninety three. I believe that U.S. has invested. Is that is yes? That uh, the, since nineteen ninety three, when the State Department set up its demining program, <clears throat> the U.S. government has spent over four hundred, uh, or excuse me, over four point two uh, billion dollars. It comes out to about uh, you, you know, depending on the year. In the past year, it's about 250 million that the U.S. government spent worldwide, with some additional resources spent in Ukraine specifically. So those are big numbers, and and you know American taxpayers, we we have to thank them for everything that they've done to be to make the U.S. the leader in addressing this global problem. But I would say relative to other challenges. This is one that you see tangible benefit. Once you pull the landmine out of the ground, it doesn't come back. Yeah. Um, and so, so I, I think that the U.S. government deserves great credit on a bipartisan level across multiple administrations, but it's the American voters behind it that yeah. make that possible. Is there anything about your work that you wish people would understand better? Or is there something that's misunderstood? I mean, I think when you talk about it, it's pretty, like you said, this is a bipartisan effort, <clears throat> not, you know, everyone wants to get behind it. But is there, from an educational standpoint, if, are there hurdles that you still need to clear, just even in terms of, you know, educating governments or securing the funding that you need? I, I think the biggest hurdle we face <clears throat> is reminding people it's a problem of today. Mm. Now, the, the, the tragic silver lining on the Ukrainian crisis is it is causing people to think about it. I mean, Zelensky talks about landmines when he stands up before sure. all of Congress. Sure. And Ukraine is our greatest priority, but there are kids dying in Myanmar. There are kids dying in Ethiopia from, from landmines that are being laid actively, not from the past, but mm. right now uh, as a result of those conflicts. So our biggest challenge is, I would, I would say, reminding the world that this is a contemporary problem, as well as the Diana moment, as well as the, the movies from the 20th century that you watched. Yeah. And, and we need to lead on Ukraine, but we also need to focus on those forgotten conflicts, too. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's important work. Um, Chris, Valeria, I'm going to give you both the last word. Um, is there anything that either of you would like to share with our listeners and viewers that maybe I didn't bring up? <clears throat> Start with you. I just want to express again my huge thanks and uh, say that you don't need to be Ukrainian to support this, to support, you don't need to be a mine action specialist to support this issue. You just need to be a uh, human and not to forget about this issue. And I just want to thank all the different Americans, organizations, companies, individual philanthropists like Mitzi, who have found themselves in this moment and found a way to lead. We wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. We could, we could make the decision to just get out in the field and start clearing as soon as the Russians were pushed back from the gates of Kiev because we knew that there were Americans who had our back. Uh, so whether that that's John Deere, whether that's uh, that's Facebook, who helped us with putting out uh, information to Great. to on, on explosive risk, whether that's uh, donors like like Mitzi or the U.S. State Department, uh, it, it, it's it's knowing that there is this level of commitment and understanding of this priority that it, that enables us to get out in the field and do that. Great. And it's um, <clears throat> DonorC.com uh, slash Ukraine. I, I believe you said that's where people can go to learn more about Halo Trust and to help out your efforts financially. That's great. Chris, Valeria, thank you both for taking time to join us today on Coffee with Closers. We wish you continued success with all the important work that uh, you're doing both in Ukraine and around the world. <clears throat> Again, um, Thanks very much. It's, it's an honor and privilege to have you both join us today on Coffee with Closers. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Steve. Steve. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. We're the Pinkston team, and this has been Coffee with Closers. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes and follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. 
Catch us next time. We know you're not busy. <laughs>